What is up, everyone? I hope you are doing fantastically well today. This is Rafael Garcia here for episode 92 of the Let's Talk Wrestling podcast. It is Sunday, July 17th. And as always, I want to take the time to thank you for listening to the show, whether you do so live. Well, actually, you can't do it live, excuse me. Whether you do so the day of, in the rear, when it passes, whatever it may be. I appreciate everyone who takes the time to listen to this show, wherever you may find it. As always, you can check us out on multiple platforms, including MMARatings.net.com. You can check us out on uh, YouTube at MMA Ratings. You can hit us up on Instagram and Twitter, MMA Ratings Net. You can catch this show on Acre, Breaker, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Overcast, Spotify. Me, myself, you can check me out at rgarcia underscore sports in both spaces. So again, thank you for taking the time to listen to our content. We appreciate you all. And I have a lot to talk about today because... We had another great edition of AEW Dynamite this past week with Fighter Fest. We had a, a pretty strong episode of NXT as well, too. Um, Finn Balor returned to SmackDown, and the fans did as well. I want to talk about that, because I have some interesting thoughts about that show, too. But I also want to talk about uh, Money in the Bank. That is tomorrow, and I want to do a little preview of that show, as we usually do, or we try to do more of on this podcast here. So let's go ahead and jump right into this week's show by talking about Fighter Fest, which was, again, a very strong showing from start to finish. But the AEW was doing a great job of putting on consistent shows to begin with, but with their fans in place, they've just really blown up and continue knocking home runs out the park each week. And I hope that they really continue this momentum as much as they possibly can. Uh, they popped a million viewers this week, and I think they're at 1.02. May have been the last number I've seen. So they've popped a million uh, viewers. I think they surpassed Raw in the main demographic, 18 to 49, or whatever that demographic is. So they've been killing it as usual. This show featured um, John Moxley versus uh, Carl Anderson for the IWGP United States title. This was a great match. Um, Moxley won clean just as he should. But I really appreciated this content. It was a good um, showing of both men. People often forget that Anderson can go. Uh, he is, hasn't always been a tag team guy. That's really how, what he's known for today. But the dude can work. And uh, they put on a hell of a good match. To open up Wednesday's show. Uh, the biggest moment. Well maybe not the biggest moment. My biggest moment. Because it has my boy in it. Ricky Starks. He got the pin on Brian Cage. To become the FTW champion. Basically. What occurred was. Um, Starks. Uh, hit the spear. On Cage. Which you know is funny. Because Cage should be able to easily take a spear from Starks. But he took the spear after Will Hobbs hit Cage in the face with the FTW title. And what this set up, because Hobbs kind of hesitated in giving the belt over to Starks after he won it. So obviously where that whole group is going to fall apart at some point in time. But it was a nice little hint at something that may be coming in the future. Something we all really see. And as a lot of people really say when it comes to professional wrestling... Predictable wrestling isn't always bad. If you if you can if fans can predict the winners, who's gonna win, that's not a bad thing. For example, everyone knows that Kenny Omega, excuse me, is going Kenny Omega is going to lose to Adam Page at uh, All Out. That's really what everyone's really leaning heavily toward. And if knowing that, okay, that's all well and good. That doesn't stop me from buying my ticket, spending six hundred dollars to go to that show in September. Uh, everyone knew Kofi Kingston was going to defeat uh, Daniel Bryan at WrestleMania a couple years ago, but that didn't take away from the impact of the moment. So predictable wrestling works, and, and we know that Team Taz is going to split at some point in time. So it doesn't necessarily make that situation worse or less desirable to see. Uh, Cody Rose and Malachi Black, they had a moment. Uh, I The thing about this... I loved how they made it seem like Malachi Black wasn't there to begin with. And then it switched it up to him being there 
and him he and Cody had different color suits on which little touch little touch but Cody had on the white suit and Malachi Black had on the black suit obviously and that was something that was just awesome to me I loved that little touch um Heyman Page had a good interview and that was another strong segment and we get the Dark Order versus the Elite a 5 on 5 match now I am of the mind that Hangman and um, Kenny Omega should not be in a ring together at all until all out comes. I want their first action against each other to be a big moment. I think the best way to do that is to keep them away from each other. We can hint towards Omega being in a match, but then at the last minute switch saying that I never said I would be in a match. I never said what five guys would be in a match. Instead of me, we have Michael Nakazawa. Or instead of myself, we have Kenta. Or someone else takes his place and really kind of kicks that off. Matt Hardy versus Christian. I really don't care about that at all. You know, it is what it is. Uh, Christian picked up the win there. Let me see what else happened. Um, pull this back up. Sammy Guevara and Yuta Wheeler. I don't know much about Yuta Wheeler, but he's a name I've been hearing a lot about recently. He's done a lot of tryouts, Ring of, Ring of Honor, um, WWE. He's at AEW this week. I think Impact looked at him as well, too. So he's a guy who's really kind of getting some shine and getting some looks like a hot prospect in the industry. I don't know too much about him, but him and Sammy had a very good match. Sammy picks up the win here, I am interested in seeing more of Wheeler. I want to see more of him and wonder where he kind of really um, ends up. Penelope Ford and Yuka Sakazaki had a match. I mean, I don't get my people. Like, Penelope Ford just isn't good to me. Maybe it's just me. I don't know what it is. But I'm not interested in seeing her. I feel like that a lot with, I hate to say, a lot of the AEW women's division. Like, if I look at it's like the white women in, in a division. Outside of Britt Baker, I really don't care too much to see of. I mean, I don't really... Britt is cool, but she's not at the top of my list right now. I mean, I have Big Swole, Thunder Rosa ahead of her. Um, I wanted to see something done with Diamante, but, you know, that like, that's really not going to be done. Same thing with um, Ivelisse. I thought they had some opportunity there, but that didn't really occur. So I... I, I and cool and, and, and this is the only women's match they had on the entire show. Two hour show. This was the only women's match that they had. So they they've made some improvements with how the women are being booked over there in, in AEW, but there's still a space to really improve there. So this wasn't the greatest of matches from a start to finish either. But they looked like they looked um how am I gonna say I say this? I'm not going to say Penelope before looked green. She just didn't look good in this position. And Sakazaki didn't as well. And I know she's ex- extremely experienced as well, too. So I don't really know what you do with either of these women in the future. But I don't need them on my TV. Especially when you look and you look at AEW Dark and AEW Dark Elevation, how they are having more women featured there. They could put some of those matches on Dynamite. They did, They could. They could do something with a big swole segment. I don't think she's been in front of fans yet. They could do something with her and put her in front of a, a bigger group like that. It doesn't have to always be Britt Baker and no one else. So let's see what they really do with that in the near future. Um, Darby Allen and Ethan Page had an excellent coffin match. It felt short to me, but I mean that's why. These matches are, I mean, this matches on TV during the week, so I obviously understand that they had time constraints. But the show, that match felt really short to me, uh, but it was great. I really enjoyed it from start to finish. Um, Allen coming out with the with the the plate on his back to kind of get the early advantage was a very nice touch. Ethan Page, he's a guy who I did not care about when he was announced joining AEW. I was just like, eh, whatever. But he's won me over. Uh, the dude is a star. He could go anywhere in any organization and be a star. And he is really looking like the type of guy who could be a main event heel. I'm not sure if he'll get to that point in AEW, especially not anytime soon. 
just because what it looks like they have lined up for their main event picture. But Ethan Page looked really good in this match. Darby Allen got the win. I don't, I don't feel like Darby Allen needed the victory here. Uh, he's, no, I'm not gonna say he's the main man, but he's definitely picking up some, some growth. He's definitely becoming more interesting uh, as a main event star. I do believe Darby Allen is going to be AEW World Heavyweight Champion at some point in time, but. He and Ethan Page had a very strong match, very enjoyable from start to finish. I mean, as I keep saying about AEW, there is an excitement around their shows that just is not there whenever you talk about WWE. It's just not there at all. And we're going to talk about that when we touch on SmackDown later on from their show last night. But the fans are on their feet throughout majority of AEW Dynamite. There aren't any of those chants like what or CM Punk or whatever when fans try to quote unquote hijack a show. None of that's going on because these AEW fans are entertained from start to finish. That is the challenge that WWE really has to improve upon because their content is not entertaining from start to finish. So all in all, I've really been enjoying AEW Dynamite these last few weeks. Not much to complain about. On any one of them, because I know, you know, sometimes I come off as I'm belligerently hating on NX AEW, but that is never the case. Uh, I think AEW has a very strong product, and I do believe that they are going to. I mean, there are already clear competition for AEW, but I think they have even more success to look forward to in the rest of 2021 and 2022. When they come back to DC, I will definitely go. Um, WWE has a show planned on September 11th. I'm not interested in seeing it at all. But even though, even though it's a house show, maybe maybe I'll try to make something happen for that, that house show. But AEW, when they come back to the DC area, I'll definitely be in attendance. And in my opinion, that is a testament to how well their show has been performing for me these last few weeks. So I want to move on. And we're going to talk about WWE from this past week. I don't even really remember what happened on Raw. Don't care. Um, I, even, I don't even care. It's the last Thunderdome show. That's really the only bit of reference that matters there. I think Xavier Woods pinned Bobby Lashley. I believe that that was that that, that was this week. And I am I was surprised. I, I was. I was surprised, but you also kind of want to be happy for Woods getting that major win. But what is that really going to end up being? I do hope we get a situation where Big E wins the money in the bank and then moves over to Raw. We're going to be talking about that in the preview and reuniting that group. But let's see what really happens there and how things kind of play out. Uh, I wanted to talk about... Karrion Cross defeating Johnny Gargano. This was pretty much, again, predictable. We knew that this was going to be the outcome of the match here. Um, Gargano is so good. He is such an excellent, fantastic wrestler. And even though he's a heel as a part of the face, he does an exceptional job of getting over with the fans. Like, even like his character. And even Austin Theory, I know we're in a place in this world where we're not supposed to praise or say anything good about Austin Theory. He, uh, he's been playing his role very, very well. But Johnny Gargano and Candice well, actually, I'm not even going to just say them. Johnny Gargano, Candice Lorraine, and Indy Hartwell have been the stars of the way. And this Wednesday's match against Karrion Cross, you knew Gargano was going to carry that guy. Even though Cross isn't a bad wrestler, he's just not interesting. Right now, Gargano went very far to carry him, and he looked um, great in that match. I want to talk about Dakota Kai. I'm probably going to write about this tomorrow as well, too, because I think her story with um, Raquel Gonzalez is going to be interesting to watch unfold. This past week, she defeated Ember Moon clean. Great match. They always have good matches. Dakota Kai is one of my... I actually think I included her on my list of potential MVPs for halfway through 2021. But Dakota Kai's story with, with Raquel... And the reason why I say that is because 
Kai is being played up as she's going to feel like she's being overlooked. You notice this past week, Zia Lee walks out to challenge Raquel Gonzalez. Kai steps in front of Kai, uh, steps in front of Gonzalez, and Lee just walks right around her, doesn't even acknowledge her. This isn't the first time that that happened. Io Shirai did the same thing. Mercedes Martinez did the same thing as well too. I think this is going to be a continued trend that plays up until Kai gets tired of it. Now, I have a hard time thinking of Kai being the heel in this situation, but it worked in the past with Shawn Michaels and Diesel, and that's how they've really been comparing these two, talking about these two. So let's see what that looks like. I'm, I'm interested. I'm actually going to be writing about this this week. You'll probably see me publish it tomorrow. But that's something that I'm, I'm kind of, that's, that's a story that I'm interested in telling. Uh, Saray, she defeated Gigi Dolan, uh, also known as Priscilla Kelly. This was a good match. You kind of knew Saray was going to win. She hits that basement drop kick into the ropes. Oh, man, it looks so, so ridiculously stiff that it's almost hilarious at the same time. I got to get more of that. I love seeing. If you haven't seen Saray in a couple weeks, I wonder why. But she can work, and I, I'm interested in seeing her, her growth. Gigi Dolan. I think she looks good. I was a lot of people when they think about Priscilla Kelly, they go back to the tampon spot from 2019, 2018, whatever year that was. And I know that got a lot of people buzzed, but I think she can be someone who is a good performer for NXT. My thing is, I'm always a fan of women on the roster who look different from the others. Uh, Ruby Riot looked different. I um, mean, obviously Naomi, Bianca Belair. They look, they look different from the women who are mainly featured, the blonde, long-haired women uh, with the, all these extensions, et cetera, et cetera. Gigi Dolan has a different hair color. Her gear needs some work. She just basically wears like all black, kind of like a, like a Stone Cold kind of look to her. She has a, I'm not even going to say that. But if Tony Storm has a bottom, Gigi, Gigi Dolan has a bottom as well, so I'm just going to go ahead and say that. But... I, I, I think she looks good, um, and I'm interested in seeing more of her. I hope we get to see more of her. Now, she's just not pushed out of the um, – out, like, she's just not pushed off the TV again. Tony Storm was actually supposed to be the one facing Saray, but as you know, Tony Storm's getting called up to SmackDown. She'll be making her debut next week. So, uh, Gigi Dolan has been kind of inserted into that slot, and I hope we get to see more of her on television and see some development there for her. I really wish that they would do a women's NXT breakout tournament. I'll probably be writing about that too this week. Uh, Santos Escobar, he picked up a win uh, over Dexter Loomis. Um, and that was, an, it was, that was important because he and the rest of Legado Del Fantasma are being booked as the next top or, or, the, or the group to face the hit row next. And you can't have... Santos Escobar losing match after match after match and still being put in these feuds as if he's some threat. At some point in time, that he has to pick up a consistent string of victories. So seeing him defeating defeating someone like Loomis helps get that on the road. I'm not sure how they're going to continue building wins for him. They should continue building wins for him and giving him more over time. But let's see if they really do that. I am interested in Legado del Fantasma against Hit Row, but I do wish that um, Legato got called up to the main roster. I think as a trio, they could be a very strong unit against someone like, let's say, the New Day. After, uh, let's say, Bobby Lashley wins the briefcase and Legato debuts on that following Raw, and we have a feud there. That could be something that could be really good. To see, I would like to. I would like to build around that, but I don't think we're getting that anytime soon. Um, I've said it before. I've written about it. Santos, Santos Escobar is a main event level hill, without any doubt about it. There's no way to even play around that. He is a main event level hill. Let's see what else happened. Uh, Duke Hudson. He was the former, formerly known as Brandon Vink. I didn't even realize that. But he picked up a win over Ike Manjaro. This was the first match in the NXT breakout tournament. And I thought Jiro was going to win this match. I get, I, I get why they have a lot of um, hype around Hudson. He looks the part. He's big. He, can, he worked well in this match. But Ike Manjaro, he has, he's a, he has that look about him. Again, 
He's someone that could be pushed into a star. Fans are, I get why fans like him. It was, this was probably my second or third time seeing him perform. Um, I just think that they kind of missed the boat on not booking him to win this match. I'm not saying he should win the entire thing. I think Asher Hale and Carmelo Hayes will be in the end. Or um, the other big black guy. Can't remember his name. But uh, I think I think we're going to see some good action here from NXT, uh, the breakout tournament. I want to say probably the biggest talking point from TakeOver, or not TakeOver, goodness, NXT this week was the Robert Stone brand, oddly enough. So Aaliyah and Jesse Kamea lose a match to Caden and Casey Carter. And Aaliyah attacks Robert Stone, slapping him around a little bit, beating him up in the corner, and walks out. Frankie Monet, Frankie Monet then um, comes out, and Jesse Kamea leaves with him. Robert Stone does as well, too. Now, backstage, they say that Aaliyah is gone. She's, she's, not, she's an afterthought. And what was interesting is that Mandy Rose appeared. She appeared in, during the Saray Gigi Dolan match, but she also appeared here, too, as well, in the backstage segment, saying that business looks interesting. And what's it clear? So we know that Aaliyah and Mandy have been traded, meaning that Mandy is now a part of NXT and Aaliyah is going to go up to WWE Raw. I'm not saying that that's a great move. I, the, neither one of the, those women are like the greatest of workers. So we'll see what that looks like, what their characters do. But I am intrigued in what's next for Robert Stone. I've always thought that that could be a funny group. And with Frankie Monet in charge, I've wanted to see a stable of women I want to see a, a, a mixed gender stable, actually, with a woman in charge. And we could get that with Frankie Monet being the woman running the show. So that's another topic there as well that could really be covered. But NXT was a good show they, in this week, in my opinion. They had about 705,000 uh, viewers this weekend, which was an improvement over the last two weeks. They were sitting around 650 both of the last two weeks, so I am I was pleased with that. Again, NXT has always been a, a, a good show to me. I will make sure make it a point to catch it week after week. I know people often. I know the cool thing is to talk bad about NXT as well, as if all of it's bad. But we know that that's not really the case. We know that that's not the truth. Also, this week, WWE welcomed fans back for SmackDown. Now, I'm not going to talk about the whole show. I'm just going to talk about a couple of different things, but. Fans being there definitely do make a difference. We've seen that already with Dynamite, and we saw that with um, SmackDown as well. We know, like, you always wonder, we've been wondering who's over, who's not, and how over are they during the um, pandemic. We've seen the rise of Bianca Belair, for example, and people have been wondering how over is she. The reaction she got on Friday was bonkers. People were dancing to her theme music, singing along with it. I mean, there wasn't no, I don't think anyone was really quiet when any, when she was around in the ring at all. And when she broke out using her hair, people popped for that. So I am glad to see that. I'm pleased to see that because we've been saying that Bianca is a big star and uh, we, we get to kind of see that. Now, um, Finn Balor also returned, and it's kind of that's what, what's been talked about for a while. He returned, he attacked um, Sami Zayn. Now, here's the thing though subtlety, 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 subtlety. During Finn Balor's run in um, NXT, the second run, he's mainly been wearing the black colors. I think he was wearing red for his match against Ilya Dragunov over in. Um, NXT UK, but he was wearing blue on SmackDown. I'm hoping we do not get the we we do not take a backward step to that smiling version of Finn Balor. Nobody wants that. We want the intense version that we have been seeing in NXT for these last few years. That's what we want. That's what people want to see. Because that is what, that is what works. Um, 
I hope you don't go backwards. They did still have the Titan Tron, say Prince, as in Prince Devitt. That's kind of what he was going by that, quote unquote, um, over in NXT. So let's see how that really plays out. But I do not want a softer, smiling version of Finn Balor. Nobody wants that. We want that intensity that we saw in TakeOver. That was his probably his best run in um, WWE as a whole. He does not need to go back to using the demon gimmick at all. This dude can work, and let's keep him uh, within that intense, strong character. That's what everyone wants to see. But I did have a question about whether or not the fans returning made this show better. It made it more enjoyable in a sense, but the booking of the matches were not better, per se. And I want, I'm going to pay an, an very close attention to how people are talking about that, especially with Monday Night Raw coming up this week on Monday with fans, because the booking across the board for WWE has not been good. That has been the challenge. It's not that fans can fix that, but fan cheering and interaction does not replace or does not fix bad booking. For example, news broke on Friday that Bill Goldberg is supposed to be returning on Monday. Nobody wants that. The consent, the the over the the resounding response across wrestling Twitter was, "What the fuck." I wrote about that for our Friday as well. Like, why are we do? Why are we doing this again? Because he is not the answer. Bill Goldberg is not the solution. I understand that they have him contracted to do. I think it's two matches a year. Great. I am not against him getting his money. Get your money. However, he doesn't need to be inserted into the the, the, the title picture every single time. Every single time. No one wants that. Nobody does. And WWE's answer to struggling ratings or to giving this content a boost is by bringing back somebody old, doing Legends Night, doing retro shows. That shit doesn't work. So let's see what Monday looks like. The only thing I want to see is Bobby Lashley get his hands around Goldberg and ragdoll him in a hurt line. If they give me that, I can find some uh, semblance of appreciation for this. I doubt they'll do that. But that's the only thing I really want to see come from Bill Goldberg's return. So the final topic I'll talk about today is previewing the Money in the Bank pay-per-view that is on Sunday. So we're going to run through these matches here. Uh, I'm actually going to talk about every one of them just because all of them have some, have some value per se. But let's just go ahead and knock these out. Uh, Rey, Mysterio, Rey Mysterio and Dominic Mysterio are going up against the Usos in the pre-show for the tag team, the SmackDown tag team titles. This match doesn't mean much. Uh, I think it's time to get this, put the titles back on the Usos so we can have that uh, Bloodline stable be fully booked as the, the, the champions. I think that's how we do that with this match here. Ray and Dominic, I mean, I don't really give a fuck about them. Put the titles on the Usos. That adds another... Uh, another um, layer to that match. Um, Ricochet versus John Morrison versus Matt Riddle, Drew McIntyre, Biggie, Kevin Owens, King Nakamura, and Seth Rollins in the Money in the Bank ladder match for the world title. Ricochet is back to doing Ricochet things. If you watch his last, his he's had three matches with John Morrison. <laughs> In the last three weeks, and all of them have been great. He's been doing ricochet shit. WWE's been allowing him to do ricochet stuff, and that is what is important. I wonder if they continue doing that. With fans in attendance, they have to continue doing that because dude can put on a show. Do I think he's going to win this Money in the Bank ladder match? Absolutely not. Would I be excited if he did? Of course. My money right now is on Bicky. I don't think we need to put it on anyone who's had the title in the past. Um, John Morrison isn't winning that. Matt Riddle, I could see them going that route and kind of letting that lead into him, something between him and Randy Orton, but I think that they're going to get the tag team titles as RK Bro first. Drew McIntyre, absolutely not. Keep him out of the title picture. Kevin Owens, I just don't think that they have the faith in him or King Nakamura 
to really kind of let them have an extended run. And then we have Seth Rollins, and Seth Rollins has already had a briefcase. He's a multiple-time champion. He doesn't need it. So my opinion right now is Big E, that's kind of where I'm leaning. My big wish will be Ricochet. We also have the women's side of that where Asuka, Naomi, Alexa Bliss, Nikki Ash, Liv Morgan, Selena Vega, Natalia, and Tamina. Now let me just say right out the gate. Natalia and Tamina have no business being in this match. Because clearly that means that the women's tag team titles are not being defended. They just lost twice to Tia Knox and Shasta Blackheart. They were in a angle with Dana Brooke and Mandy Rose. So what the hell are they going to do with Dana Brooke? Now, if I was her, I would be greatly concerned. But Natalia and Tamina have no place in this match, so I'm taking them both out. Zelina Vega, I could see the, the, the briefcase being put on her. Um, she just returned, but they've already kind of cut some of the steam out from under her. So I, I'm not really kind of sure how that's going to work out, but I could see the title being placed on her and she being a threat to... Bianca Belair. My hope is that Liv Morgan wins and she goes to Raw to challenge Rhea Ripley. Um, Liv Morgan is someone that they can really elevate. They've they've done so many stops and starts with her. She has a good look. She has gotten better in the ring as a wrestler these last two years, per se. So I am I'm interested in what's next for her. I think she's my favorite right now to win the women's Money in the Bank ladder match. But I wouldn't be surprised if she didn't. This Nikki ass shit sucks. Period. I know people are happy for Nikki that she gets to take part and, and she gets to be elevated a little bit with this character that she created. I could not hate it less. Like, who is this for? Children? Well, guess what? A, a WWE struggling in that demographic right now. This is, it's it's comical to me. It's almost a hero crap. Absolutely, no, it, like it's, it's not Mighty Molly. It's not um, Gregory, uh, Shane Helms, Hurricane Helms. It's not any of that. It just looks like shit to me, and I'm not a fan of it at all. Oscar, I don't see them putting it on her. She just had it last year. Naomi. Another, just like Kevin Owens and uh, Nakamura, just someone else they're not going to give a main event push to. Alexa Bliss, um, I could see her getting it. But again, she doesn't really need it because she's already been booked so well and so strong for so long. I would hate to see that briefcase put around this version of Alexa Bliss and seeing her get another title run. Because her character just hasn't been enjoyable. I, she's been doing well with it. But it's just not enjoyable at all. Bobby Lashley versus Kofi Kingston. I think this is going to be a really good match. A really fun match. Lashley's obviously going to win. Again, predictable booking is not always bad booking. But Lashley definitely should win this match. He should. I think he's going to dominate Kingston. That's why I'm wondering if Big E wins... Does he come back to Raw and uh, go up against Bobby Lashley? I think that that's the plan, which I would love to see at SummerSlam, but this Goldberg shit got me worried. So let's see how that kind of plays out. But, but Big E, as a, title, cha- a title, title challenger, I'm here for it. Um, Rhea Ripley versus Charlotte Flair, mm, this is hard. This is hard to call. I think they're putting that belt back on Charlotte. She gets a reaction. Whether it be good or bad, people boo her, people hate her, people love her, but she's legit. I think that belt's going back on her. And I think she's going to beat Rhea Ripley clean. The booking of Rhea Ripley hasn't been good since coming up to the main roster. She's been booked kind of like a joke. And she, like, she's, just, she's just a goofball on the main roster. She's not who she was in NXT, and it's not really working either. Um, AJ Styles and Omos versus the Viking Raiders. AJ Styles and Omos are going to win this. I think they eventually lose the, the titles to um, to RK Bro. But I, I don't know what they're going to do. What's the long-term plan with that group? Because you can't split AJ and Omos because you can't do anything with Omos after that point. And what are they really doing with AJ right now? He's a Hall of Famer already. 
I would love to see him go do something else in NXT or something like that, but that's probably not going to happen. Um, Roman Reigns versus Paul Heyman. Versus, um, yeah, no, excuse me. Roman, Roman Reigns with Paul Heyman versus Edge. Oh, I don't care about Edge. I wasn't a fan of his during his first run when he was healthy. Er, I'm not a fan of this version. I just want this to be over. Hopefully, Reigns finishes him off. Um, we're supposed to be getting Seth Rollins versus Edge at SummerSlam. That's really kind of what they've been hinting towards. Uh, Rollins and Edge have been in a lot of backstage segments, especially last night, calling back to when um, Rollins was threatening to injure um, Edge even further, which makes sense. But I don't need Edge in the, the title picture. I'm just not a fan of his. It's like he's boring to me. Like they have so many other youthful young performers on that roster that they could be building a main event feud around with Paul uh, with with Roman Reigns that I don't need to see more of Edge. But again, that's just so that's everything I wanted to talk about tonight from uh, all professional wrestling this week. As I said, this is the Let's Talk Wrestling Podcast, episode 92. My name is Rafael Garcia. You can catch me at rgarcia underscore sports on Instagram and Twitter. You can check out net and .com and hit us up on Instagram and Twitter at MMARatingsNet. This podcast can be found on YouTube at MMA Ratings, And you can check us out under the same name under all the podcasting networks. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the shows tomorrow. Um, Slimiversary is tonight, I believe. So have fun with some professional wrestling. Stay safe, everyone, and have a great rest of your weekend.